organize a webinar on unlocking the block structure to mute your microphones. It will give much convenience for this session. And if you have any questions, you can post in the chat box. I hope you all are in the best of your health. Next, it's a time for welcome the guest speaker, student branch counselor, and the participants, and to set the context for this session. I warmly welcome Ms. Sapnas to address the welcome speech. Greetings. I am delighted to welcome you all for unblocking the blockchain on behalf of the IEEE student branch of Rajarata University of Sri Lanka. IEEE student branch of Rajarata University of Sri Lanka is the student chapter of IEEE at Rajarata University of Sri Lanka. We have so far organized many knowledge sharing events and contests. Tech Talk Rajarata is a monthly tech session conducted by IEEE student branch of Rajarata University of Sri Lanka. We have created speakers out of our students earlier, but now we have extended it and having speakers out of our university as well. Blockchain technology is on everyone's lips, but hardly anyone understands what it exactly is. Nevertheless, the expectations are high. So first of all, let's become clear about blockchain so we can understand this technology's potential for the industry. We are very much delighted to welcome our speaker, Mr. Jihan Jeet, a student researcher at the Informatics Institute of Technology and Assistant Program Manager, IRC, Sustainable Education Foundation. We welcome all our participants heartfully. I request you to be with us until the end of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Saknas. And I'm honored to invite our speaker to continue this session. Thank you, sir. OK, guys. Uh, thank you for the warm welcome. Uh, so yeah, I think we can start the session. Uh, let me share my screen first. Okay, hope you can see the slides. Yes, we can see. Uh, is the slides visible? Yeah. Okay, sure. So, okay, then uh, let's start with the presentation. So as uh, told, I'm Jehanjit. Uh, I'm from informatics. I'm starting my third year, which means I'm going to start my internship uh, in next month. So that's about me. So let's go ahead with the session today. So blockchain. So what is this blockchain? This thing have been peaking around a, a lot lately. So what is this blockchain? So before understanding what is blockchain, first we should know what is a database. So a database is actually a collection of data that is stored in ele stored electronically in any kind of medium. So it can be a server, it can be a hard disk, it can be cloud device, cloud storages, so anything. So anything that we are storing data is called a database. So blockchain is slightly similar, but a little bit different also from database. So when you go through this... Uh, uh, text in the slides, you would have understood, you would have found some keywords. So decentralized, distributed, what is this? Subsequent blocks, what is this? So decentralized and distributed, one of the two main concepts of blockchain, decentralized. Now let's say if we are taking a database, for example, a database is centralized for one place. So centralized as in now we are storing the data in one hard disk. For example, let's say a hard disk. So we are storing this data in a hard disk. So this hard disk is located in one place. So it is centralized. So and again, uh, if this uh, data is being lost, so only one copy is there. It is lost. If it's lost, it's completely lost. Let's say even if you are maintaining any uh, backup strategies like three to one backup strategies, for example, so even though if you are maintaining backup, so if you are using three to one backup strategy, you have six copies. So if all six are lost, then totally lost. So when it comes to a technology like blockchain, the data is not centralized for one place. It is distributed. It is distributed among all the nodes in the network. So it's actually really hard to lose the data because every net, every node in the network will be having a copy of this blockchain. So this data won't be lost. 
So there are types of types of blockchains. So there are public blockchains, there are private blockchains, there are hybrid blockchains. Hybrid as in that's both private and public. So advisable is to have public blockchains because when it comes to private blockchains, there are lots of drawbacks. I'll discuss about the drawbacks in the following slides. So now let's say, for example, a person A wants to make a transfer for person B. Now, if that transfer is stored in a database, that is just one record, one record stored in the database. So it is really easy to hack in and manipulate that data. You can, uh, I'm not saying hacking is easy. Uh, it is possible. So hacking into one computer and changing one record that he haven't paid is not a big deal other than uh, changing all the nodes in the blockchain network. So if the, if this record is stored in the blockchain, actually it is really, really hard to manipulate that data because every node will be having a copy saying that A have made this transaction to B. So that is one of the main advantages when it's come to blockchain. So a brief history of blockchain. So there are lots of uh, other events also happened in the past. So I have noted down some main events. So in the 90s, the concept of decentralization is developed. Decentralization, again, as I told, it is not centralized for one place. So in 2009, Bitcoin was found. So a person or an organization which is still anonymous called Satoshi Nakamoto. So uh, the tech community is uh, referring to him as a person. So this Satoshi Nakamoto have created Bitcoin in 2009, which is an example for cryptocurrency. So in 2011-12 period, the involvement of cryptocurrency came into real world example, uh, real world applications. So like Bitcoin came into real, uh, Bitcoin is one of the best examples for cryptocurrency. So uh, stuff like that came into real world applications. In 2015, Ethereum white paper was re released. So uh, also Ethereum was, Ethereum blockchain was also released lately in 2015. So at the beginning of 2015, uh, Ethereum white paper was released. So Ethereum is a little bit different from Bitcoin actually. Ethereum, uh, it has some other features as well, like uh, storing smart contracts, uh, recording supply chains. So we'll discuss what are those in the uh, later on presentation. So after 2016, blockchain involvement came into day by day applications. There are even countries which were built on top of blockchain, completely blockchain. So uh, we'll discuss about all those things. Okay, now let's uh, see what are the main concepts in a blockchain. So as the name says, blockchain, it's, it's a chain of blocks. So blocks, one of the main important uh, elements. Second, there's nodes. Third, there is miners and validators. So a block, a block is basically the data that we want to store and a hash and the previous nodes hash. So uh, hash as in, uh, we'll, I'll, I'll explain what is a hash. So now let's say uh, when we want to store some data in the blockchain, we are not going to store data as in gigabytes of data like we store in a database. So we store only the important data that we need to store in the blockchain, which is like we don't really need to be manipulated because uh, storing stuff in a blockchain is not much of a cheap uh, process. It's really expensive. So when it comes to stuff like that, we store only the really important data. So that data and a hash and the previous blocks hash will be stored in the block. Then what is a node? A node is basically the every electronic device which is maintaining a copy of this blockchain. So when you are connected to a blockchain network, so let's say, for example, if you are connected to Bitcoin, so your device, which is your laptop or your mobile phone, which you are using to access, which you are using to associate with this blockchain network, will have a copy of this total blockchain. So that way you are also a node in this network. Then there is miners. So there is something, uh, there is one of the, another main principles of blockchain, which says that the records are really validated, which are really trustable. There can't be fake uh, details added to a blockchain and it can't be manipulated. So these things should be kept by someone, right? So these things are man uh, being recorded and uh, when we when you want to add a transaction so this transaction is validated or mined by a certain amount of people certain group of people called miners or validators so let's see one by one so uh, blocks as we told uh, you can understand what is a block just by looking what is blockchain just by looking at the name so it is a chain of blocks so these blocks as i told uh, it contains the information that you want to store then i told that there will be a hash 
a hash is actually a 256 bit number so what is this hash and what is encrypting there is there's a different between these two so actually encrypting is different from hashing encrypting it's actually a two way function so when you want to encrypt a text or a image you can encrypt it with a key and there will be a key to decrypt it so you can decrypt it and you can get the first message the the very first message that you encrypted but when it comes to hashing actually you can't dehash there's nothing called dehash so when you hash something it is hashed it is completely random now let's say for example we are hashing the word blocks so when we hash the word blocks you will get a 256 bit number which is completely random you won't be able to guess what is that just by looking at it so uh, even though if you do any computational process to find out what is the what this hash really is the probability of finding the correct answer is 2 to the power 256 which actually seems impossible so uh, that is the reason why we are storing hashes so no one even if uh, someone is looking at it because uh, this blockchain network is really distributed right so everyone will be having a copy so we don't want everyone to find out what this data is so in that case we are storing this as a hash so only the person who stored will be knowing what that is so now let's say if he wants to know whether it is manipulated or not what he can simply do is he have the data so he can hash it again and he can compare it with this hash so that way it is possible to maintain its anonymity and also it is possible to maintain it's uh, unmanipulatable uh, status so it is not manipulatable and no one can actually just look at it and find out what this is so the third element is actually the previous blocks hash so as the name says it is a chain of blocks this chain is maintained by recording each nodes each nodes hash and it each, sorry each blocks hash and its previous hash so now let's say if there is a second uh, block in the data in the blockchain so that second block will be uh, referring to the first block so the third block will be referring to the second block so in that way the chain is created so now which means that the first block the very first block won't be having a previous block so that is called the genesis block so that is uh, the very first block so it is called the genesis block so it won't be having a previous block reference okay then nodes so as i told previously nodes is like every digital device which is connected to with this blockchain network so every device which is maintaining a copy of this uh, blockchain will be uh, referred as a node in the blockchain then there's miners and mining pools so as i told this miners are basically the people who help us to make sure that these transactions are valid and uh, they will be doing this mining process it requires a lot of computational power and a lot of uh, brainstorming actually you have to have a huge a huge uh, mathematical knowledge to do this mining process so when this mining process is done actually this is the way that you can actually earn from bitcoin or blockchain so when you do this mining process and when you validate a transaction or mine a transaction then you will be getting a reward uh, an amount of uh, cryptocurrency so that is how you can actually earn from uh, this blockchain and there's mining pools mining pools is simply the miners coming together because this mining process takes a lot of computational power as i told so for this uh, we need like really good hardware so now let's say if you are using your mobile phone or your laptop just the normal laptop day to day laptop that we are using day by day so that is actually not uh, that good to do this kind of mining process because it requires a lot of computational power and you have to find this hash first before any other miners found because this algorithm is actually making the miners compete between each other so the person who is finding this hash first will be doing the will be accepted as the person who found the hash first and he will be the miner for that transaction so others effort is going to be lost so you have to find this hash as fast as possible so for that you need a lot of computational power and very good hardware so now let's see an example where uh, one person wants to make a transaction to another person okay now let's say elise wants to send two bitcoins to another person called bob so uh, what alice will be doing is alice will be broadcasting a message to all the miners 
with these four parameters. So again, that's another keyword called bro broadcast, right? So broadcast is actually not like the simple messages that we send. Broadcast is like pushing a message to every listening part. So uh, best example, what they use in like Pizza Hut, Burger King, the, the message services they use. So uh, the messages are sent using uh, broadcasting. So the every listening part will get that message. So here also the broadcasting technology. So Alice will be broadcasting that message to all the miners in the network so uh, she will be mentioning uh, Bob's public address then the amount of bitcoins so now let's say I'm, I'm taking bitcoins for example so the amount of bitcoins that she needs to transfer then uh, her signature which is uh, created with uh, her public her private address and the uh, details about the transaction and then her public key so she will be broadcasting all these four parameters to the miners. So then the miners will be actually, the, the miners will be, what they will be doing is they will be checking first whether these uh, coins are owned by Alice, whether she is uh, able to do this transaction. So if she is able to do this transaction, so then what will happen is uh, these miners will be starting the mining process, which is to find this hash. So this finding hash process is a really, really time consuming and energy consuming process. So every miners will be competing between each other to find this hash. So the first miner who finds this hash, which is completely random, a uh, random hash for which is uh, completely unique for this block. So out of all the total blockchain network, this is a unique uh, hash for this block. So that when he fi finds that hash, so he will be broadcasting a message to other uh, miners saying that he have found a new block. So when he found a new block, he will be adding the that block to his block his no his uh, copy of the blockchain, and he will be telling other uh, nodes, other miners in the network to add it to their uh, copy as well. So they will be checking whether it is true, and they will be adding the copy to their. Uh, their co their blockchain copy as well so the only the person who found the hash first will be getting the reward so others will lose their effort so this is one of the drawbacks when it comes to this blockchain technology but uh, there is a fix we'll talk about it in the later on presentation so we were talking a lot of blockchain lot about this bitcoin so bitcoin is actually just one of the ex applications of this uh, blockchain so there are other types of applications as well so first with uh, we'll start with cryptocurrency uh, best example is bitcoin so what is this cryptocurrency and how does it differ from the banking that we are day doing day by day so the evolution of money actually started from uh, what we mentioned as galugaya so in the galugaya actually people were using stones and seashells so those things as money and then uh, later on uh, came the money, actually the physical paper money, then the coins and all. Then third, which was the banking. And now we are talking about cryptocurrency. So we actually do not uh, consider the Galuge as one of the generations. So money will be the first generations. Banking is the second. Now cryptocurrency is the third generation of money, of uh, transactions. So... Now, if we are moving towards a new technology, there will there should be some drawbacks in the existing technology. This there should be a reason for us to move for a new technology, right? So, what is the issues with banks? So, the main purpose of us uh, using this uh, cryptocurrency is to remove this middleman called the bank. So, there's the re there are some reasons for us to remove this middleman. So, the first and foremost reason is the transaction charges. So now let's say if you want to make a huge transaction through a bank, there's a very huge amount or sometimes it even becomes a percentage of your transaction as the service charge. So which is uh, really problematic when it comes to like really huge uh, transactions. And second, the trustability. Now let's say if you want to make a million dollar transaction, so it's not a low amount of transaction like uh, hundred dollars or two hundred dollars it's a million dollar transaction so the bank will be needing some details 
from us so what is the reason for this transaction who we are sending this money to what are we buying what is this reason so this kind of data it can be our high priority so this data is private for us but we need to share this data with the bank in order to do this transaction so this is another issue with the current day uh, transaction current day money which is the banking uh, so we are tr- we have to trust our confidential data with the bank another drawback then when it comes to international transactions when we are doing transactions between uh, countries so another huge issue because uh, it consumes a lot of time now let's say if it's between the same bank that's okay the time consumption is low but when it comes to transaction between banks it's really hard and the time consumption the service charge and all that's like really high so that is where this uh, cryptocurrency comes into play so this cryptocurrency is completely anonymous uh so everyone in the network will be knowing that this transaction happened but no one will be knowing who sent to whom because everything that the person that everyone in the network will be knowing is this public address sent this amount to this public address so this record will be there forever because every node will be having a copy of this record that this transaction happened but no one will be knowing who sent this to whom so in that way the anonymity is kept also the transactions cannot be faked uh so this money actually does not exist physically this is just a record existing in the computer network in a ledger in a distributed ledger so this uh, blockchain also can be considered as a distributed ledger because it has only the records so another main thing to move into cryptocurrency we can't actually just move into cryptocurrency because it is not accepted vividly between countries because uh, now let's say for example uh, in our country cryptocurrency is not accepted at all because uh, we are talking that this anonymity is good but there are some drawbacks as well in this anonymity now let's say for example uh, all the transactions which are happening in the dark web are done using this cryptocurrency because uh, there are lots of illegal transactions happening and uh, you don't want to expose yourself so you can simply use this cryptocurrency so no one will be knowing who who are you sending this money to who are you just everyone will be knowing is you sent this amount this public address sent this amount to this public address so that is all the network will be knowing so you can do a lot of uh, illegal things when it comes to cryptocurrency so that is one of the main drawbacks to moving towards the third generation of uh, transactions um yeah so now uh, let's have a look into what is this public address and this private address because lately we have been talking a lot about this public key and the private key so uh, public key and private key are like a pair of keys so this is actually used for an AC, called as asymmetric encryption so this is a way of uh, doing encryptions um, now uh, let's understand that with an example so now let's say this bob person wants to transfer a rec- uh, transfer some message or a record to this uh, alice so uh, what he will be doing is he can't just randomly send out just uh, if it's a confidential report he can't just send it as the report as it is because anyone who is hacking into this communication in the middle will be able to see what they are sending so if it, if it is a really important uh, message so this uh, third person in the middle will be understanding and he can uh, take actions against these two people so that is where this encryption comes into play so this uh, public key private key encryption method is actually now let's say this bob wants to send this message to alice so he will be requesting from alice for her public address first so this public address here anyone can share their public address with anyone so this public address is not actually that much to be kept secured because it is public it is supposed to be public so that is like the address for yourself so this pub when uh, so uh, when he is uh, when bob is requesting alice for the public address so alice will be sending the public address so then uh, then bob has the public address so what he will be doing is he will be encrypting this message with the public address of alice which is uh, available for everyone so but uh, this is now encrypted encrypted with uh, alice's public address 
so now the key to decrypt this message is the private address of Alice which is only be kept by Alice. Alice won't be uh, sharing her private address, private key uh, or private address with anyone. So this the private key is like the proof to herself. It's like to prove that it is her own keys. So this uh, when uh, now uh, when Bob sends this uh, message throughout the network, so anyone hacks into this message won't be understanding what this is because it is encrypted and the only key can decrypt this message is her private address. So this private address is actually kept only by herself. So no one will be having, uh, no one will be able to uh, see this message. So when she receives the message, she can uh, decrypt it with her private key and then she will be able to see the message. So that is what this public key private key mechanism is. So this public key private key mechanism comes into blo uh, blockchain as well. So there are something called wallets. So the best example, there are lots of Bitcoin uh, wallets that you can even download from Google Pay, Google Play or App Store. So that is like the, that is like an, ex uh, you know, you have been heard of password kept to record your passwords their applications right so this is something similar to that so in what you do in this wallets is basically you store all the pu public addresses all the people's public address that you need to do the transactions plus your public address and the private address so now let's say uh, so as we discussed previously the transactions happening in this network is completely anonymous so everyone will be knowing just you are sending this uh, this address is sending this much amount to this address right so even when you want to make a transaction for a person he will be giving you the public address so again in the uh, using the wallet application what you will be doing is you will be just sending this amount to this public address so if you make a small mistake uh, just a, just one digit is changed then you are doing this transaction for a different person or a wallet which is not existing at all so that is problematic so this wallets actually help us to maintain these public keys and maintain our public keys and private keys in a secured way so when you want to choose a wallet so you have to do some research because this wallets uh, now we are trusting our private key with this wallet so you have to do some research and you have to find out whether this is a secured wallet or not you have to read some uh, feedbacks from the users and all and the soft uh, now let's say for example we never read the software uh, agreement when we are signing up to something but when it comes to applications like this it's advisable to read those things so uh, this wallet so when we have a wallet so this public key and private key comes into play as the addresses of the wallet so this public key is like the address for your wallet and private key is like your ownership it's like the something that you have to prove that this wallet is owned by yourself so there are some types of wallets as well so there are the main two types are hot wallets and cold wallets so hot wallets as in online wallets cold wallets as in offline wallets and there are some other types of wallets as well which are like software wallets hardware wallets and paper wallets which are like not in play that much so this hot wallets and cold wallets so online wallets and offline wallets so online wallets you can just simply understand now let's say if you want to join into a network so you create uh, you uh, create your wallet so then you will have a private key and public key so you can share your public key with others so others can send you money to your account to your wallet so but what is this cold wallet which is an offline wallet so now when a transaction is being happening a transaction is being done through this blockchain network what it will be simply doing is simply it is sending this amount to this address so now when you want to have this wallet offline you can create this wallet offline and you can share the public address of your wallet with someone who wants to make a transaction with yourself so they can do the transaction but it is not updated in your wallet until you become online so when you become online you'll get the updates and then again you can go offline so you can have your wallet offline as a cold wallet so whenever you want to update your transaction you can go online and you can make the transaction you can get the records and you can come offline 
So that is what the difference between this hot wallets and the cold wallets. There are like types of wallets. So now, uh, if you are not planning to uh, use a wallet, so there are some issues actually. So as we told, now if there is one, uh, if there is an issue, like you missed just one digit in the address, so you are making the transactions completely to a random stranger or an account which is not existing at all. So when the transaction is done, it is done. There is no way that you can get these transactions back. So in that way, uh, these wallets are really help, helpful. And uh, for now, uh, let's take a scenario when one person have sent this uh, transaction for a, uh, for a wrong address. So the only uh, thing that you know about this ad about the person or the address that you send this uh, this uh, transaction to is the public key, right? So the only thing that you have you can do is you can if if that is existing you can uh, request, but which is impossible because it is anonymous. So you can't find out who this person is. If not, you have to find the private key of this public key, which is again impossible because you can derive the public public key from the private key but you can't derive the private key from the public key because if a person is able to derive the private key from the public key it is like making the uh, hacking really easy but when we are moving towards something like this so we should uh, maintain the standard right so it's completely impossible to get that money back so wallets will be helpful for us in that way so there are uh, so we were discussing about uh, bitcoin so uh, in previously also we were talking a lot of about uh, bitcoin wallets so there are something called the mining pools as we discussed previously so there are lots of uh, bitcoin mining pools around the world today so this is a uh, statistics of uh, 2020 march so as this says there these are the mining pools ex existing today so this mining pools, so there is a pool in F2 pool, btc.com and it and pool, which are the which are having more uh, priority than the other ones because they are having control over the network more than the others. So now let's say because of this mining pools, there are some advantages and disadvantages as well. So these mining pools are actually consuming a lot of computational power. So according to this statistics, it says that the Bitcoin mining pools in in the world today, uh, the amount of electricity that they are using can be used to power up the whole country of New Zealand, the whole country of New Zealand, if not 5 million households in the US. So that's actually seems a little bit problematic. So when these mining pools are using or wasting so much of energy, because you can't actually just say it is using because all the miners are competing between each other. Now, let's say if there's a transaction to be uh, validated so all these uh, people in this network everyone will be uh, trying to find uh, the hash first so all these mining pools will be using their computational power and wasting this electro uh, energy but only one mining pool is gonna succeed in this process at the end so others effort or the wastage of this electricity is gonna be there so this uh, effort is gonna be wasted so uh, there are some fix we'll discuss about this fix so that is not only that is not the only issue with this blockchain so there is something called this 51 percentage attack so 51 percentage attack means now in the previous slide as we saw uh, there are these mining pools right so uh, this mining pools this percentage means actually the amount of uh, nodes that they have inside their mining pool so in this total network of this bitcoin 17.7 .7 nodes are owned by this pooling so f2 pool is owning 17 percentage of uh, nodes in the total uh, bitcoin network so now when we were talking about uh, blockchain at the very beginning we told that the nodes are decentralized and distributed but here the one of the key aspects of this blockchain is being lost so the nodes are coming together and creating mining pools so because of this creating mining pools process, the again, it is kind of getting centralized. So one, uh, one aspect of this uh, blockchain is being lost. So now if let's say if someone wants to approve a false transaction, so what they can, what they will be doing is they have to uh, add a false transactions 
also they have to make that the majority now uh, previously when i was telling about uh, the types of uh, blockchain so i told it is better to have a uh, public blockchains than private blockchains now i'll explain what is the reason for that so now uh, when it comes to uh, private blockchains now let's say if the network of uh, ieee club uh, is having a network uh, of block uh, uh, blockchain network within ourselves so which means we all know who are these people owning these nodes so we know everyone in the network so one thing anonymity is going to be lost because everyone is knowing who are the nodes in the total network again when it comes to the amount of people in the network now let's say if the ieee club is like 20 people totally so the 20 people will only the 20 people will be having a copy of this uh, uh, blockchain so if someone wants to manipulate a data in the blockchain there's only 20 copies existing so you can convince uh, 10 people in the network and you can ask them to uh, change a re- change a simple record so now let's say 11 records are changed in the bitcoin in the in the blockchain network in the blockchain 11 records are uh, manipulated and changed which is a false transaction or a false record so the fa- now in the blockchain network the false record is having the majority more than 50% is manipulated but still the false record is holding the majority so the what the blockchain network will be simply doing is simply it will be identifying this uh, false record as the first one as the uh, proper one and the minority one as the corrupted one so what it will be simply doing is simply it will be deleting the corrupted ones and it will be sending the majority record to the minority ones so every nodes will be again getting a copy of this manipulated one so that is where the another principles of uh, blockchain is being lost so when you have a smaller network in a private blockchain so this kind of attacks are possible so that is why uh, we should uh, i told it is better to have public blockchains because public blockchains you don't know who are the nodes in the total network so it is really impossible to convince all these people all the nodes in the network and hack into all those uh, things all those uh, more than 50 percentage of nodes in the network and uh, manipulate the data so you have to do that if you want to really if you really want to do that you have to hack into more than 50 percentage of nodes and you have to approve these transactions before a certain amount of time so that is that really seems impossible but this kind of becomes possible when it comes to a network like this because here more than uh, now the percentage this depending on this percentage so if there is 70 uh, 17 percentage is controlled by this pooling so uh, they uh, 17 percentage in the network can actually uh, accept a false transaction so but again more th- uh, it is less than 50% so it will be again the false transaction will be identified as the manipulated one and it will be destroyed but still now let's say for example these four ma- four pools are coming together so if these four pools come in together then uh, they can actually even accept false transaction because they are higher than 50% so if they accept uh, if they manipulate a record in all the nodes in their network uh, which is more than 50% so the blockchain network will be simply identifying the manipulated one as the ma- majority so the minorities will be deleted and this majority records will be sent to the other net- other nodes in the network so the whole network is corrupted but this is uh, not going to be happening in bitcoin because uh, everyone knows if something like this is going to happen so if something like this happens simply they will move from this network to another so this is not going to happen in bitcoin but this is possible this 51 percentage attack is possible so simply saying again uh 51 percentage attack means one person or a group of people so one person as in one miner or a group of pe- people as in the mining pools having the control over the blockchain so they one person of the group of people having the overall control of the blockchain so this is also not the last drawbacks so there are some other drawbacks as well there is waste of time waste of energy waste of computational power and waste of effort because these miners are competing between each other to find out the find the hash first 
so but only one miner or one mining pool is going to succeed so others are going to lose their effort their time is being wasted they are wasting lot of energy lot of electricity is being wasted the computational power and their effort their mathematical knowledge it is being wasted so when we are moving towards a you know a grown or a digital network or a digital next tech next generation so if there is drawbacks we should come with solutions right so there is solutions everything we have been talking till now is proof of work one algorithm existing in this blockchain network so there is another algorithm called proof of stake there are some other proofing algorithms as well but we are not going to discuss about them because they are not in the play much so proof of stake and proof of work are the highest play, highest uh, priority these days so uh, because as we have discussed previously everything that we have discussed about miners is actually proof of work so this proof of work algorithm is basically letting the miners in the network compete between each other so they can find out the uh, they can uh, find out the hash first and they can get the rewards but when it comes to proof of stake it is a little bit different actually the people are not the miners they are not called miners actually they are called validators so these validators are not just uh, competing between each other this is like you have to stake an amount uh, amount of cryptocurrency to become a validator in this network so you have to stake an amount as in you have to pay an amount and you have to keep it in the blockchain in network so then only the network will be allowing you to validate transactions because you, we don't the network don't want you to do false transactions simply if you approve false transactions you will be losing that money so this seems a little bit uh, uh, convincing uh, uh depending on the issues that we discussed previously with the proof of work but still there are some issues as well this proof of stake algorithm is kind of favoring to the rich let's discuss how that is so this proof of stake algorithm will be not randomly selecting the miner so this what this proof of stake algorithm will be doing is first it will be analyzing the transaction amount now let's say if you want to approve a 10 million dollar transaction so then it will be coming and checking among the miners who is having an um, a proper amount of stake which can be uh, which we can trust with to approve a 10 million 10 million dollar transaction because now let's say if a miner in, in if a validator in this proof of stake uh, bitcoin net blockchain network so he wants to approve a false transaction of 10 million dollars so and he have uh, only staked an amount of 1 dollars or 2 dollars so if he approve that false transactions he's going to lose just 1 or 2 dollars which doesn't uh, make sense at all it's just, completely inconvenient because he is losing a very low amount of money and he is approving a very high amount of uh, amount uh, of a transaction so which is really doesn't seem convenient so in that way the network will be selecting the miner or the validator depending on their stake amount so that stake amount now let's say for example the 10 million dollar transaction so the network the algorithm will be going through the stakes and the miners and depending on the amount uh, and the depending on the amount of the stake it will be selecting one person or one validator to validate this transaction so only that validator will be putting his effort to validate so this is co selected completely randomly also considering the stake amount so the miners are not competing between each other and they are not wasting the computational power to do the validating process so in this again it is called validating process not the mining process so this mining process now uh, because the validators are not competing between each other so we can actually take some time to do this validating process this validating process can be done by taking time so we can actually use our normal computer so we don't need that much of energy or that much of electricity we don't need that much of high uh, quality hardware because it is actually giving some time to do th validate this transactions so we are not competing between each other so we can take our time but again when you are going over time then the algorithm will be identifying you as you are not working in this transaction validating process so it will be selecting another person to validate this transactions so 
that is one of the best things in proof of stake because it is not allowing the mind, the validators to compete between each other so this validating process can be done with simple hardware so now you might think isn't the 51 percentage attack is possible in this proof of stake algorithm as well so it is not possible because when it comes to this blockchain when uh, for example if we take the bitcoin network and bitcoin network is actually still using the proof of work but let's say for example if they are switching from proof of work to proof of stake the 50% of the stake amount should be 79 billion dollars so one person have to stake more than 79 billion dollars to have more than 50 percentage access in the network to approve false transactions so which doesn't seem which seems completely impossible okay now let's see some other uh, implementations of blockchain uh, in the real world uh, scenario so throughout the whole presentation we were discussing about one implementation which is cryptocurrency because cryptocurrency is like one of the main implementations uh, nowadays uh, when you look at the blockchain technologies applications. So that is not the only existing technology. There is uh, uh, only existing application. There is supply chains, one of the main things. So supply chains, as in now, let's say, for example, we, are, we have to track a vegetable supply chain. So from the seeds until it becomes a dish we have to track it so this seems a little bit inconvenient why we why do we have to track a vegetable now let's say uh, for example now let's say in our country uh, the vegetables from norelia has the best demand in the market so let's say there are there is like 10 kilograms of carrot from norelia and one person have to take this 10 kilograms of uh, carrot to the market in Colombo. So when he's taking this 10 kilograms, he is simply adding some another 5 kilograms of carrot from another place, which is not exactly from Norelia, but he is adding that, he is mixing that with the vegetables from Norelia and he is going to Colombo and he is selling that as vegetables from Norelia. So he is getting a high uh, amount, uh, high uh, advantage in that but still uh, he's doing a false transaction or he's uh, doing something illegal so uh, he, again when it comes to something like this in simple terms supply chain of a vegetable it is it doesn't seem much convenient but uh, by tracking this vegetable uh, in a blockchain network uh, sub, uh, supply chain of blockchain so there it has a value because uh, this record cannot be manipulated. So when 10 kilograms of carrots are harvested from Norelia, the record is added to the blockchain network. So when he is selling that uh, 10 kilograms, so he have to sell only 10 kilograms in Colombo because this is being tracked. The chain is being tracked. So again, when it comes to vegetables, it doesn't seem convenient, but the supply chain with, Bitcoin, with the blockchain network was uh, brought up because of one main reason. So in 2013, in Europe, there was a scandal called Horsemeat Scandal. What happened is simply uh, the person who was supplying beef to the beef to a burger place have been mixing horse meat with the beef. So the people who were eating also didn't know that they were eating horse meat, but actually it was beef mixed with horse meat. So the burgers were made out of that. So when this was brought up only, this solution was brought up with the uh, supply chain with blockchains. So this can be properly tracked. So when the uh, beef is being produced, they have to actually record the amount of beef being produced. So they can only supply that much amount of beef. And when the people, when the burger place people are preparing the burgers, they, they have to have a certain amount of uh, grams of beef that they will be allocating for one burger. So they can actually produce a limited amount of burger or a certain amount of burgers. So if they are going over than the amount that they are supposed to produce which means they are actually doing something illegal so these things can be tracked with the uh, supply chains then again there's another application which is smart contracts smart contracts uh, are like contracts like we have in day-to-day -day life but it is actually stored in a digital way now let's say a is uh, making an uh, agreement with b saying that he will be paying this much after this process is done but uh, after uh, so when if this is stored as just a paperwork 
so uh, after the process is done he can just completely go mia he can't be found anywhere so if something like this happens so it is completely lost you can't actually find that person because it everything exist is just a paperwork and you have to search and find that person but when it, when it comes to something like storing this in a blockchain network you actually have the record stored in the blockchain so now when this process is done and when the uh, when the validators or the miners are accepting approving that this process is done the amount of the money that is supposed to be sent to him will be automatically sent to him so this deal will be kept the contract will be taken to the next step so we don't actually need the approval from the uh, from the other party and we don't actually have to wait until they do the transaction because uh, this network it, itself will be doing that for us so this uh, transactions also uh, another main reason to storing this uh, contracts the blockchain because it is immutable so as we discussed immutability is one of the main key concept of blockchain so it is immutable so it is really helpful so there are some other applications as well which has like uh, storing medical records uh, and uh, storing the income the monthly or yearly revenue of a person so the the government can track that to uh, you know take the tax tax from that person so those kind of things are like the real world examples and implementations of blockchain so now let's say uh, let's see into what are the areas that a government can implement to improve this uh, as improve ourselves as a country so where they can use this blockchain so the very first thing is digital identities so digital identities it's not like the nic card in a digital way it is like a tracking of a person from birth till death so this digital identity so when he it, it will be having the record about this person from birth till death so where he is born his parents so his parents will be also having to a uh, blockchain so to it is linked to two blockchains so then when he is getting married it is getting linked to another blockchain so other than that all the records about this person so the vehicles that he is buying the monthly revenue uh let's say his medical records all these things will be stored in this uh, blockchain network so it is even easy for the government to be uh, keeping records about people because uh, when it comes to when it comes to scenarios like let's say previously in our country there was a scandal saying two people have entered the country without authorization so when there is uh, something like this actually it is easy to track those people because so they won't be having a blockchain Uh, which is uh, originated for our country so in that way it is easy to track those track down those people so the second application and the third application i would like to talk about e voting and healthcare so again these two comes under digital identities because uh, e voting there is uh, the normal e voting which is not involved in blockchain as well but it is uh, really easy because you have to just hack into one system and you have to increase the votes but when it comes to uh, e voting with the uh, blockchain it is not easy because one blockchain will be voting for one person so the that vote is vote is made by that blockchain so it is not uh, easy to hack into these things then healthcare so healthcare uh, again the medical records about a person is really uh, private so you can't share your medical records with everyone but again you want to keep them uh, for yourself and you want to share them with the people who wants to uh, have the have your uh, have the especially we are talking about the doctors actually who want to have a look at your medical records so this medical records if we are maintaining the medical records from birth till nowadays so it is easy for the doctors to uh, uh analyze about yourself when you are having a disease and all then there's this fourth and fifth concept that i would like really like to apply in our country which is land registrations and vehicle registrations so when it comes to land registration or vehicle registrations the main reason that i consider this as something which is really uh, good for our country because there was a scandal a few years back saying that one vehicle with a fake deed have been going through five or six buyers so five six people have been paying for this vehicle which is which doesn't even have a deed which is completely anonymous 
so this uh, so when it comes to a record uh, of blockchain for these vehicles so when there is even a second market for this vehicle so the blockchain network will be simply saying that he is the second owner who is the first owner so this can be tracked so there cannot be fake numbers for vehicles so this kind of applications will be really useful when it comes to applying these things as a country when we are growing as a digital country so the best example for countries developed with blockchain uh, with uh, blockchains uh, i would suggest is estonia a country called estonia so if you google there's a really good youtube video that you can find and you can learn about this country so everything in this, in this country is built on top of blockchain it is a, it's like every concept that we are discussing today is applied in that country so cryptocurrency digital identities healthcare registrations everything's are maintained using uh blockchains in that country so you can if you want to learn more you can google and find out them so there's a really good youtube video that you can find so that's all what i wanted to cover in an introductory session so for further studies i would suggest this book mastering bitcoin so when you want to learn about blockchain it is actually a really confusing technology so if you learn about bitcoin first then it will be easy for you to even understand more so i also started first with this uh, mastering bitcoin book then i went to mastering ethereum so uh, i would also suggest you all to start with this book so it is really easy for you all to understand so in today's session yeah we so covered uh, what is blockchain the history the main concept cryptocurrency other applications of blockchain then uh, uh bitcoin mining pools proof of work proof of stake the implementations and the areas that the government can cover to improve as a country so yeah that is all what i wanted to cover as an introductory session so now we can move into questions uh yeah it is a good question actually we can uh, expect uh, for automated softwares but still uh the reason it we are not moving towards something like that is because these uh, things we are talking about money and transactions so these things it's better if a person who have some uh, general knowledge which has some you know artificial intelligence uh, something like a uh, common sense uh, is doing this transactions more than a system or a computer program is doing this so it is possible to make that but uh, it will be another drawback to the system in my opinion so it is uh, possible but uh, when we are implementing something like that it will be problematic because uh, the transaction is going to be approved by someone without uh, intelligence so intelligence is required for approving or validating transactions like this Uh, yeah if you have any questions you can unmute your mic and ask or if you post you can post it in the chat section so uh, to say new emerging uh, uses of blockchain technology is actually uh, these things uh, cryptocurrency is mainly in the play these days but uh, when it comes to supply chain or smart contracts it's not much used uh, nowadays uh, so that is also some uh, can be considered as something new into this uh, applications of blockchain uh, other than that uh, i would say uh, the digital identities is one of the main things uh so there are lots of researchers going on i am also currently working on a research project of uh, uh creating uh, digital identities to our country so it if that something like that is being implemented it is really good but uh, we don't know when that is going to happen so i hope that answered your question
Uh, the uh, amount of the rewards that the person is getting uh, depending on the transaction that you're approving is not actually fixed. So I also haven't done any uh, mining process to actually say that because Bitcoin mining is actually really hard. You have to have a lot of computational power. You have to have really have the hard hardware and all. But uh, as far as I know, that is not a fixed amount. So depending on the transaction that you're approving and the, depending on the speed, so uh, depending on those parameters only, you will be getting the reward. So that reward is not a fixed amount. So can you elaborate more about the search domains? So yeah, so now to talk about the research domains, actually uh, when it comes to projects now, uh, because this blockchain technology is new and it is uh, currently trending in the industry, so when it comes to even normal applications, people tend to use this blockchain technology in their applications. But actually, it is not something like that. You have to have a purpose for using this blockchain technology. You can't just go and randomly use this blockchain technology just for an application like Facebook or WhatsApp. There's no use. Now, uh, when it comes to something like this uh, digital identities, there is some use. You have to track something which is immutable. But uh, so those are some uh, research areas. Now, let's say there, if there's something like uh, something you do not need to be uh, changed or altered by a random person who doesn't who is not authorized. So something like uh, storing that in a blockchain network will be more efficient than storing it in a normal database. So I would suggest uh, so the research areas would be you should uh, con take consider of a uh, place where the immutability is really required. So that is one of the key concept of this uh, blockchains. So you should really consider into uh, fields that uh, immutability is really required. So when you want to do some researching. So now also we are working on something like uh, this uh, digital identities and uh, storing the criminal records on uh, blockchain. So again, when it comes to criminal records, that is this uh, immutability is really required because uh, sometimes when it comes to people with power, the records one day is there, next day it's not there. So this, when it's stored in, uh, when there is a digital identity identity system and this, uh, trans th this records are stored in the blockchain network, it cannot be manipulated or cannot be deleted. So when it comes to stuff like that, uh, it is more uh, appropriate. So really, uh, if you want to uh, you know, go further with the research level of uh, in this uh, blockchain networks, uh, it's advisable for you to consider the stuff which are which is uh, really the immutability is required. I uh, hope that you answered. Uh, actually, uh, as long as I know, yes. Uh, so according to the book that I read, the Mastering Bitcoin book, uh, it says that it is depending, the reward is depending on the amount of the transfer that is happening. So to be exactly sure, I haven't done any mining processes to uh, say it confirmed, but uh, depending on that book, it is depending, uh, the amount is actually depending on the transaction. The reward is depending on the transaction, yes. Hope that answered your question, Vikashan. So if there's any other questions you can ask. So it seems like uh, that's all for now. So uh, you might get some questions further on now, let's say if you are starting to study in this field. So you might get some questions. So I'll put my LinkedIn ID here so you can shoot me with questions whenever you have questions, whenever you need some advice when you are starting a project related to Bitcoin, the uh, blockchain. So yeah, mm, yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, then I consider it's a great time to invite Vidushana to propose what of that. Thank you, Prabalini. Good evening to all. First of all, I would like to thank you all. You gave me an opportunity to speak on this webinar, and it's a matter of honor for me. 
on behalf of the ITB student branch of Rajaratne University of Sri Lanka, I would I would like to thank our speaker, Mr. Jihanjit, who has made the best webinar on blockchain in his such a short time, and our branch counselor, Mr. Viraj Udana Vikramarachi, who gave the best support for us. And finally, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to all participants present today. I hope that this webinar helps you out to know about the blockchain and meet you all on another webinar. Thank you and be safe. Thank you guys. Thank, thank you, you for the opportunity. Thank you, Vishana. And thank you for your interest on this webinar. I hope that you will have uh, got a couple of ideas regarding this session.